Good morning, afternoon, evening, night, whenever you're watching this, welcome to the Mr. Sin channel. Today we're going to be talking about Unit 2, Topic 8. We're going to be focusing on women and demographic changes. Now throughout Unit 2 we've been talking about different political, economic, social, and environmental consequences and factors that influence society and their demographic breakdowns. And today we're going to be continuing that conversation, but we're going to be focusing on women's role in society. And at the end of this video we'll also get into Ravenstein's Laws of Migration. Alright, before we get into all that good stuff, take a minute and answer this simple question. Is the world's total fertility rate increasing or increasing? is it decreasing? Now over the last 60 years, the world's total fertility rate has been decreasing and this isn't by accident. In 2020, the world's total fertility rate is right around 2.4 babies per women. And this is because of all the new opportunities that women have in society. We're going to be looking throughout this video at different political, economic, and social factors that are changing in society that are actually impacting population growth. Women around the world are now able to get access to education and open doors that were never open before. Not only are they learning new skills in school, but they're also learning how to be better mothers. This is lowering the IMR. And when women feel confident that their children will live past infancy, well, they're going to stop having as many kids. All of this decreases the TFR of a country. And as women continue to get education, they're more likely to then get higher education, use those new skills in the workforce, pursue careers. And all of this opens more doors for opportunities for women to be financially independent Independent, and it also reduces the amount of time they have to have children. When looking at the world today, we can see that countries that actually allow women to get educated and also offer women economic opportunities have a lower TFR. That's because women here don't have to rely on a man to be able to support themselves. Women can be financially independent. This allows them to pursue their own careers, their own goals, and be active members in society. This also pushes back the average time that people get married and also reduces the amount of time that people people have to have kids. If women are now active in the workforce, if women are now pursuing other goals, they have less time to have large families. And all of this reduces a country's TFR. Since we're on the topic of economics, we could actually look at how the developed world is more urbanized and very career focused. If women have large families, they're going to have to take off for maternity leave frequently. This doesn't allow them then to get ahead in their profession, to be able to move up in the company. As they keep taking time off, they're not able to get as much done at work. Now, on the other hand, the developing world, they also still have to take time off after having children. However, kids in the developing world, particularly societies that are very agricultural focused, are seen as economic assets. They can help the women around the house with chores and also be able to help out on the farm with getting food and supporting the family. While in the developed world, again, kids aren't necessarily economic assets. They actually cost you a lot of money. Another factor that impacts a country's TFR is access to healthcare, access to medicine, advancements in healthcare. All of this helps lower a country's IMR. It allows children to live longer, which reduces family sizes. We also see that access to more doctors and nurses and better technology will allow the mortality rate for women giving birth to also decrease. This is known as the maternal mortality rate. And really what it's looking at is how many women unfortunately die while giving birth. The lower this number means, well, that means that society is more advanced. They have better doctors and nurses and better resources to be able to help women be able to give birth. If that number is higher, that means that they're lacking these important services. And unfortunately, that means that women aren't living through pregnancy. Now, one last healthcare component we could talk about that's a little bit controversial is access to contraceptives. Societies that allow men and women to gain access to birth control or condoms will see that their birth rates actually go down. It's easier for families to use family planning to limit their family size. And all of this impacts in the country's TFR. Finally, we could also talk about political political factors that will influence a country's TFR. Here we have our pro-natalist and anti-natalist policies, and we covered these in depth in 2.7. So if you need more information, go back and rewatch that video. But these policies have a big impact on if a country's TFR is going to go up or not, depending on how the government is going to allow women to have access to contraceptives or how they're going to reduce taxes for larger families. All these different policy changes can impact people's behaviors and change the average family size for a society. Society. All right, now that we've kind of talked about different political, economic, some cultural factors that are changing in society that have impacted women's roles and also a country's TFR, we're going to shift gears a little bit and talk about how these factors have actually changed migration patterns. And we're going to be looking now at Ravenstein's laws of migration. Now, Ravenstein came up with these laws to look at how demographic patterns and migration are happening in the world today. And we're starting to see that these laws are shifting a little bit. 
And that's because of societal changes, how we now view women and men in the workforce and in society. All of this has had an impact on the real world today. So don't worry about memorizing the order of these laws. In fact, I'm not even really reading it in any particular order. Instead, focus on the main concepts and focus on these themes and how they connect to our world today. One of the first things Ravenstein noticed is that most migration happens because of economic reasons. And most of the people migrating are young adults. We don't see families migrating as much, particularly over international borders. And that's because it's dangerous, it's risky. Young adults have less things tying them down to one geographic area. And so it's easier for them to get up and move their lives. As you get older, it becomes more difficult as you start to gain more connections to the geographic location that you're living in. Now, the next thing that Ravenstein noticed is that migrants actually travel short distances and they travel in step migration. And this makes sense. If I want to get from point A to point E, there's going to be some areas in the middle. I'm going to stop at a city. I'm going to stop at a town. And I'm going to interact with places that are closer to me. Remember, this actually connects back to a concept we learned about in Unit 1, Topic 4, distance decay. We're more likely to interact with things right near us instead of things that are farther away. Now, over time, we've actually seen that due to time, space, compression, and advancements in technology, people can now travel farther than ever before. And as Ravenstein continued to explore those first two laws, he then noticed, too, that migrants are more likely to come from rural areas and go into urban areas. We're more likely to see people go from an agricultural-based society into a more industrialized urban area. That's because of the economic opportunities that they offer. And the farther they're traveling, the more likely it is that the migrants are going to be going to a very large urban area. And when migrants move to a new geographic location, that now connects that new place back to their home. And this creates a counter stream. An example of this could be, let's say, college graduates from Florida move all the way up to Rochester, Minnesota to work at Mayo Clinic. And then people from Rochester, Minnesota moved down to Florida because they heard how great it is there to retire and enjoy that nice weather. These two locations are now connected. One thing to note about the counter stream is it doesn't mean that there's going to be the same volume between two different geographic locations. If migrants move from point A to point B, we're not going to see necessarily the same amount of migrants moving from point B to A. There is going to be interactions between these two places now, but it's not necessarily the exact same amount. The next thing that Ravenstein noticed was that large urban areas actually grow through migration. They're not going to be growing as much through their natural births anymore. Their TFR is too low. And that actually connects to the gravity model. Large urban areas have a lot of pull factors. They offer a lot of economic, political, and social opportunities for citizens that smaller communities just simply don't have. And so we can actually see that large societies, large urban areas are going to attract people from farther away compared to smaller settlements that might be closer to the migrants. They're going to go to the large areas areas because of all the economic, political, and social opportunities. And here we can also see too another law that Ravenstein noticed is migration equals more economic development. Now one of the last things that Ravenstein noticed was that women were more likely to internally migrate within a country's boundaries, while men were more likely to cross an international boundary and migrate to a different country. This was because men were seen as the caregivers, the ones who were going to be the providers, and had the financial capability to be able to migrate to a different country. However, today we can actually see that this law is kind of changing as more and more women are now crossing international boundaries. This is because women are able to actually work now and be providers for the family and have access to financial resources that allow them to be able to migrate to a different country. And as women continue to gain more rights and opportunities in society, it's only a matter of time until Ravenstein's laws continue to shift again. And we'll have to wait to see what happens. And just like that, we're done with 2.8. Now, this isn't new to you. You know the drill. Answer the questions on the screen right now and then check your answers down below. And if you are struggling with AP human geography and you need a little bit more help, don't forget to check out my ultimate review packet. It'll help you get an A in your class and a five on that national exam. All right, that's all the time we have for today. I'll see you next time when we talk about aging populations with 2.9. I'm Mr. Sin, and until next time, geographers, I'll see you online.